So welcome everyone to another month of Good for a Chat. I am Jo Taranto, a co-founder and managing director of Good for the Hood, which is a social enterprise empowering ordinary people to create community change. And we meet each month with a person that we admire uh, to talk about uh, how they've created change in communities around Australia, to find out what drives them and inspires them and why they do what they do. I'd like to acknowledge uh, that I am on the land of the Wollamadigal today. I am on the land of the Snapperfish people, on the Darug and the edge of the Eora Nations. And um, I'd like to pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and uh, also uh, pay respects to uh, elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that wherever you are today, seated or standing, that you are grounded to country as well. It's ancient and you are connected to it. And I'd invite you to share the country that you are on uh, via the chat um, and acknowledge that um, you have a history and a deep connection there to the Aboriginal people um, who are the traditional custodians of your country as well. Again, we're finding ourselves in lockdown. Uh, if you are in Greater Sydney or in Melbourne or anywhere in Victoria or beyond um, and you are in lockdown, um, then I'd like to acknowledge that we're all coming from particularly different um, headspaces and particularly different challenges again at the moment. Um, and if you're not in lockdown, you're probably looking nervously over at the other areas of Australia and wondering how you are at fair. So um, it's certainly not an easy time for anyone. So all the more reason why we're really grateful that you joined us today. Um, and also, I guess it's timely that we're having a chat to someone today who works with people um, and provides support for people who are in tremendous hardship. Um, and so I think it's a, certainly a very nice um, opportunity to hear more about the work of Oz Harvest in particular. So today's guest is a very familiar face in Australia. I know many of you have been very excited about joining this conversation today. Uh, we know that since 2004, uh, Ronnie Khan has been the founder and CEO of one of the most amazing organisations in Australia, Oz Harvest. Oz Harvest is a charity that takes food that was destined for the bin or for landfill one way or another and uh, shares it with people facing food insecurity or um, the devastation of hunger in Australian communities and certainly in other parts of the world as well. Uh, a very personal uh, inspiration Ronnie has been to myself um, on my own journey as a female founder and a starter of a ridiculous journey of the social enterprise um, and I certainly have been watching with great um, pride and admiration of Ronnie's journey for since I've been in this tiny little space of my own. Uh, Ronnie has been the subject of a documentary, Food Fighter, if you haven't seen it it's quite amazing, um, you know, about her work with the UN uh, she last year released her book, um, which if you haven't read, is a beautiful read, A Repurposed Life, which she wrote with her daughter-in-law. Um, she's a businesswoman, she's an entrepreneur, she's a policy changer. <laughs> She'll hate all of this, um, but she's an Order of Australia recipient. She's been an Australian local hero of the year. She's a mother, she's a grandmother, and she's also in lockdown. Um, so I'd really like to welcome and thank her for joining us today. Please welcome Ronnie Khan. Doing my best. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, I, Ronnie. Welcome. Thank you so very much. I too would like to begin by acknowledging that I meet you all on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my deep respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people and leaders past and present. And I'd like it known that my pronoun is she. It is a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you, Ronnie. And, and you are in lockdown. How are you faring at the moment? I am most certainly in lockdown. And I have to say, 
personally, you know, I am so privileged. I live in Bondi. Um, normally, I can look out my window and I can certainly see green today. I'm seeing black and the wind is banging on my window. So I hope it's not going to make too much noise. But, you know, I have so little to complain about because I am so personally privileged. But from a business point of view, you know, I, I employ about 250 people, not all of them, obviously, in New South Wales, but across the country. And it's a challenging time. It's a challenging time this notion of lockdown to all of us, um, where our freedoms are curtailed, where our health, there's so much uncertainty about health. And yeah, but it is also an opportunity for growth and for personal um, uh, commitment to what it is we all stand for. I guess I wanna take you back to last year, Ronnie, when the experience of, of lockdown threw us for the very first time and the global pandemic threw us all into a bit of a spin. But to understand a little bit more about what that meant for people who were already struggling with food insecurity and then for charities like Oz Harvest, what the impact of things like panic buying and restaurants closing had on your supply chain, basically, what was Oz Harvest faced with? So March 2020, March is the month that Oz Harvest held its biggest fundraiser. During that year, that month, we normally raise $3 million, which is a significant part of our budget. Um, we also hold face-to-face -face events, which is another way that we um, create revenue. And of course, mid-March, 15th of March, I had to pull and can the CEO cook-off, our biggest event, um, all of our face-to-face -face fundraising and team building and um, engagements came to a grinding halt. People were panic buying, wrapping themselves up in toilet paper and filling their houses with, <laughs> with pasta and every other supply. And so the whole supply chain for us significantly ground to a halt. So what it meant for us was for the very first time, um, for 17 years, our harvest has rescued food daily and delivered to people in need. So suddenly the supply chain was so damaged. Um, charities were struggling because volunteers found themselves in their homes. And we, I say, we didn't pivot, we pirouetted <laughs> and, um, completely had to look at redesigning our business and making sure that I didn't lose a single person at work. Mm -hmm. So we redeployed all of our staff. Um, for the first time ever, we had to purchase food. I had to lobby government because whilst in those first few weeks they were handing out lots of money, it certainly wasn't coming to our sector. And we had to lobby to make sure that some funding came our way, which it did. Um, I'm pleased to say until the 30th of June, I'm also sharing with you that I had the most frustrating conversation with the Department of Social Services this morning. And honestly, you know, as if the pandemic has finished and as if food rescue and the need for vulnerable people doesn't have a much longer tail than any particular pandemic that we are still very much in. So, so that's just to set the scene. But I will share with you some really, I, I, I don't normally do stats, but I want to share with you because I think it's, it's, it will give you such inspiration and hope as to what is possible and what was possible for us and what we rolled out. So during and, and I'm just checking that the trees aren't falling down on my head. <laughs> During COVID, so that you is- make a great conversation if it does. It's <laughs> exactly. You will be able to watch in real life. <laughs> um, I think it's really important to know that. So really, I rolled out new programs. We redesigned so that we could make sure that we could deliver on the impact because what we saw was charities were closing 
up until this point, as Harvest has always been B2B, as in we delivered food to charities. We now found ourselves delivering direct to customers because charities closed down, some um, uh, folded into others, and the level of need spread and was somewhat different to what we'd been facing in the past. So from the 1st of March to the 11th of July, we diverted 12,931,128 kilos of food from going to landfill. We delivered the equivalent of 47,517,000 meals. We cooked for the first time. We had not ever cooked meals, but suddenly there was this need for people to receive ready-made food that they could utilize because some of the soup kitchens or the places they would go to could no longer provide them with food. We cooked 875,714 meals and we're doing that again right now. And we were in partnership and continue to be in partnership with what we call HOSPO heroes, some of our wonderful chef ambassadors and industry, hospitality industry people whose businesses closed down they couldn't continue working, so they helped us make food. And we created 37 of those HOSPO Hero partnerships. And as I say, they've just rolled out again. We um, delivered 163,544 hampers because what we discovered and what has continued and has now just happened again is that international students, casual workers who lost their jobs, who have not had any support from government, suddenly found themselves with no food. And an example of that is this new cohort of people who now require support that never did. We, we also opened up a second free supermarket here in New South Wales in Sydney. And just to share with you that yesterday morning, a man came into the supermarket in his 60s and he took his produce. We're now doing hampers because you can't walk through the supermarket. And he said, I just want you to know that in 45 years, I've never not had a job and I never ever thought I'd be standing here in line to get food relief. So this is not something, this is, this is, not people who, apart from those that have fallen through the cracks, this is a real crisis. And my frustration this morning was the government tells me that they can't see that there's added need. And so it's like you want to hit your head against a brick wall for saying, I can show you the data. We can tell you how much more we're doing, every one of our agencies. But anyway. So, so I've now funny. done my rent. Thank you all for allowing me to. I we can be a, a therapeutic, um, you know, outreach service as well. I think exactly. Anyway, yeah. um, so I guess that leads to the question, Ronnie. The pandemic has completely changed everyone's business models and yeah. had to, but in ways that perhaps none of us have really thought about for organisations like your own. I know that recently you were talking with um, the CEO of, of Woolworths and um, the then CEO of Australia Post about yeah. what they've had to do. Mm -hmm. What have leaders like yourself had to do in these times? Have you just had to kind of drop everything that you knew before and be open to the possibilities of yeah. a whole new way of operating? So I think for me, I didn't have to drop any of, of my core beliefs and my core beliefs are always about authenticity and being real and truthful. And from day one, even with my staff, you know, under all the uncertainty, everyone was worried about their jobs. Everyone's worried every day. And so for me, it was saying, yes, we're in uncertain times, but I'm going to do whatever I can. And I'm letting you know that you will all have a job. My change and shift, which it did, People who were doing things that weren't we weren't able to do had to do something else. So I think that in terms of leadership, I think the most important things always for me is head and heart connected. And nothing will ever change that. No pandemic, no change, because really the reason I do what I do is to make the biggest impact and to serve the people who we 
see are in need. But I think what it's done is it's given leaders this opportunity to absolutely reevaluate their business. You know, in February 2020, I interviewed a guy for a job who would have been great, but my role was in Sydney and he was based in Melbourne. And I said, sorry, this is a head office role, number one. And when he said, well, I also, even if I go into the Melbourne office, I live far from the office, can I work two days from home? I said, no, this is a full, this is a full-time role in the office. Now, half my staff, I mean, well, all of my staff are working from home, but now I'm hiring and it makes no difference where they are, no difference. And that is a fundamental change to the way business works and the way I as a leader have to find ways to connect with my team and keep them engaged and, and stimulated and connected to the core reason that we are all doing this because now they're working in the isolation of their home. And so finding all the different ways that we can stay connected. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for leaders. And if they don't recognize that by adding the value of their business, it gave all of us, COVID has given all of us an opportunity to reevaluate our lives mm -hmm. and decide whether we want to keep doing what we did before, because when it can change like that, is that what we still want to be doing? Um, I'll get to some of your um, things in your book in a second, Ronnie, and I'm just going to ask everyone to start thinking about the questions that you've got for Ronnie um, yourself. Uh, if you want to throw them in the chat so that I can be poised to ask or um, obviously put your hand up if you'd like to ask in person. Uh, with Since I first saw you speak, and I think it was back in 2016, um, I first saw you in person, you were talking about projects then, which you were launching, uh, I think, um, the Nourish program and, and Feast and a whole bunch of, you know, education and outreach programs, uh, which have kind of flourished and continued on. Um, yeah. I guess my question for, Oz, for you with Oz Harvest is it that you are constantly finding new need in the community or do you think as an organization you're just finding better ways to meet that need or is it a little bit of both so i think i think what's really exciting for me when i started as harvest really i didn't understand the scale of the problem that's probably why i jumped into it feet and all and didn't even hesitate to think that i would not succeed the problem that I started out with was that there was all this beautiful food and it should be feeding people. And that is still a fundamental problem that we deal with. However, the minute I realized that we were taking food that would, would have gone to landfill and now goes to feed people, we have a dual role and that is our environmental impact. So I've constantly, we've been playing with these two things, bring down food waste, stop, bring down food waste, feed hungry people. And how do we do that? Not at the expense of the other, but also to the benefit of both everyone we serve. So we are an environmental and a social organization. So those programs that we keep creating, that I, that we keep um new programs rolling out are all about impact. I've never wanted to be the band-aid. I thought that by now I would have solved all the problems and Oz Harvest would have closed down and I'd have done my job. But clearly that hasn't happened. And now we're addressing both this issue of hunger and food waste, feeding hunger, but also the issue, the environmental issue that wasting food feeds climate change. Most of us don't know that actually wasting food is worse than coal, is worse than plastic, is worse than the aviation sector. And so we have this enormous role to teach and to educate. So our education programs are huge and a big campaign will be rolling out in September with those messages 
because all of us actually want to be climate activists or activists in some way, but don't know how. And yet we all have the ability to actually take action. And that's the exciting part. Mm. So I don't know if I answered your question. I can't you did. remember. No, no, you did. Was. I think you did. I think impact is um I think <laughs> impact is what drives us. Yes. Yeah. With your um and it's they're really exciting programs. I think I, I'd urge anyone that's not familiar with the gamut of programs that Oz Harvest um have. And I was at the Waste Conference uh earlier this year and we had someone present on the Oz yep. Harvest programs for food waste in particular. And, you know, I think everyone was sitting in the room going, oh, I thought you guys just took food from Woolies. And, yeah. you know, exactly. so it, it's quite amazing how you've diversified in that time. We've got a couple of questions starting to come in now, Ronnie. Um, and I sure. promise you they're not they're not tricky. Although Chelsea, who works... I'm so up for tricky questions. Don't even <laughs> worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> and if you could I lost you. I lost those... you. Oh, you lost me. Yeah. Sorry. So start yeah. Again. We just had a question about how many kilograms of food Oz Harvest rescued from March to July again. I think they just missed your little statistic there. Did you have okay. that on the end? Yeah. 12 million 931,128 kilos until the 11th of July. So from the 1st of March to the 11th of July. I get these weekly day updates. There you go, Chelsea. Chelsea works in this in this space too. She's very passionate about soil and food waste and the social economy. So that's great. Go, Chelsea. She also wants to know how your for purpose company going. And I think is that juice for good? Or have you got a couple of one of the businesses one of them? Co. So I'll just share very briefly that I created this organization not realizing that you know you need funds all the time to keep rolling out all these beautiful programs and i've never relied on government funding it's just always been a very small proportion of our total funding other than through covid when that escalated because the need escalated um, and so i thought what if we create a uh, a for-profit business that could all the profit would come into Oz Harvest. So that would help us generate um, a recurring income. And so we set up a business and I could never have believed that the name that I wanted was available, but it's called the For Purpose Co. Because that is the reason that the company exists. And under the For Purpose Co, one of our businesses is Juice for Good, which is a fresh orange juice vending machines. There's currently only in New South Wales. We were just scheduled to start in both Victoria and Queensland. COVID has made that very difficult. Um, Pre-COVID, the businesses were really going well. We went from two vending machines to 60. Um, they were all out in the community. And then post the last um, little break we had, the business was re, really rebuilding. But now we're in lockdown again and no one can go out and no one can buy orange juice. So sales are significant. It's impossible, you know. Mm. So we just And they're often have, in retail areas too, aren't they, Ronnie? So they're, they're in probably... high foot traffic or retail areas. In fact, this week, the first one rolled out in in an Aldi store, in a very new, exciting Aldi store in North Sydney, in New South Wales. But of course, there isn't a soul in the store because nobody can go, you know, you, you, you're going in for essential services. So, yep. But the, but the, will, one wouldn't upward, hopefully back to, back to yeah, some. Yeah, we'll get back. We'll get back. Of course. I've got a question from Claire and she's going to be brave and ask her yourself. Uh, Claire's down in Melbourne in lockdown again for the fifth time. Um, and Claire's an artist. Yeah, go for it, Claire. Oh, sorry. I think I may have muted you again. Claire, go again. I won't touch anything this time. Hi, Ronnie. Thank you for talking to us and thank you for your book. That was very empowering. Um, my question is actually about restaurants because I used to be a chef for 10 years until a few months ago. Um, and there's actually a huge food waste issue in fine dining restaurants, even though everyone loves to talk about sustainability, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. Um, 
Yeah, and I think that's to do with just the standard is so high, things need to be remade all the time, even if there's a minor flaw and there's always so much trim to make beautiful, interesting shapes and all this stuff. But everywhere I've worked, I've always asked about um, donating our um, waste, I guess, that's still very good quality. And everyone is still worried about the liability clause. Um, and I didn't know until I listened to your audiobook that it's actually not an issue. And I was like, oh my God, everyone needs to know about this. But so my question was, how can we let people know about the liability clause? Or is there um, resources or somewhere I can direct people or something I can share with people in the restaurants? Thank you so much, Claire. I mean, I, it shocks me that people still hide behind that excuse because yeah. it's rubbish. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, we had those laws changed in in 2005 and 2008 and 2009. Um, but yes, the the you know it the if it isn't by the end of this conversation, it'll be one of our frequently asked questions around liability on the Oz Harvest website. And the only other way, again, is by talking about it and sharing it. And, you know, most of the chefs that work with us, and we work with at least 50 or 75 of Australia's, those top chefs, all know that. And so thank you for bringing it to my attention. I will make sure that in our comms and it just gets shared again. But there is no liability to the food donor. Um, and the, the truth is we make it so simple. I mean, it's a phone call. It is yeah. a phone call or an email and a, a, a truck or a driver will be there to, to pick up surplus and it's not about quantity either. Yeah. So we, you know, if I can collect 10 small amounts from 10 different places that, are, that adds up. Yeah. Yeah, but thank you for the question. Yeah, I will I'm try to spread the word <laughs> as well. Yeah, please share that information. Yeah, for sure. Thank, Thank you, Claire. Claire. That's great. Um, I've got a question um, from, it says Ramona, but I know I can see that it's not Ramona. It's the lovely Hannah Chalmers. Now, Hannah is from Sydney as well, Ronnie, and she is 10, if not maybe almost 11, 10. She's, she's 11. Okay, she's 11. And she's a little bit of an eco warrior herself. Oh, Ronnie. we love that. <laughs> so I've just, there she is. Hi, Hannah. What's your question for Hi. Ronnie? Hi, Hi, Ronnie. I'm Hannah Chalmers. And I just wanted to say, I did a presentation with my friend at my school about Oz Harvest because I was so interested and amazed by the organization. And I just wanted to ask, what can I, as an 11 year old girl and other children like me, do to help and get involved with Oz Harvest? Phenomenal. Well, thank you so much for your question. So the first thing is, yes, you are definitely an eco warrior. And um, we can talk about how you can share at school. So first of all, I'm not sure what school you go to, but we have a program called Feast that goes into schools in years five and six. And it's a way of teaching teachers how to um, deliver a, it's a whole term of cooking, sustainability, food waste, environmental, to convert kids into eco warriors. So first of all, if your school hasn't had feast, you should go to your teachers and say you want feast at your school. Secondly, you could share, since you are so advanced and understand and know the value of food, you want to get your school involved. Does your school have a compost composter? Does your school do food drives? Um, <laughs> teaching kids about how if they brought in an apple or if they brought in a can of healthy food, Oz Harvest would come and collect it. You oh can invite, goodness. Oz Harvest has ambassadors that come out to schools to share <laughs> what Kids can do the power of recycling, the power of repurposing food, the power of composting. So we do come into schools to share that message and to create 
echo warriors within the school. Thank you. So much. Thank you so much, Ronnie. It's such it's an honor to meet you and talk well, to you. Thank you. I feel inspired by you mm -hmm. and make me makes me realize that we are in good hands if we have wonderful, <laughs> wonderful future you. leaders like yourself. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Hannah. That was great. And we've got another question here uh, from Marina, who's another amazing artist. We've um, attracted a very talented crew today, Ronnie. Uh, <laughs> uh, Marina Debris, uh, if you haven't seen her gorgeous works um, about um, ocean pollution and plastics, please check her out as well. Uh, Marina's got a question about wasting food and why it's worse than um, plastics and fossil fuels. And obviously there's the impact of methane, but she's wanting to know about the overall impact as you see it from farming practices and animal agriculture as well on the environment. Ronnie, are you, how do you feel about just speaking to that little sure. <laughs> big question. Yeah, so, you know, it's so fascinating because what we're discovering, and we've been working, so I have now got a sustainability team, and we've been working with Monash University, Deakin University, Behaviour Works, and a whole range of behavioural scientists to... Oh, so I'm going to go back a bit just so that we understand where we're coming from. What we have all lost is the value of food. So we've, and our food system is broken. And so what we've never understood is that every time we throw away an apple or we throw away lettuce, that it's the embedded value of all of the cost. It's not the $2 that a lettuce cost, it's the $10 of embedded value. So that's number one, that's just the economic costs. But if food waste was a country, the facts now show, and it's somewhat changed, if food waste was a country, it would be the third biggest emitter of methane behind the US and China. So what that means is that the, the, what, what we're not getting is that it's a little bit like the campaign that's just gone out that said a billion people, a one person throwing away a cup, a, a, I think it, it, it's, I, I can't remember the um, exact yeah, way. We can do this, we can do this. A, it's, it's a billion. Just one cup said one billion people. People, exactly. <laughs> so it's just one apple or just one lettuce said one billion people. So the facts and the, the, the research is showing that, um, and this is why I know this because I just got the campaign um, data, but I, and I can refer you to the FAO, to the UN, to all the universities that unbeknownst to us, the campaigning around coal, the campaigning around plastic, the campaigning, there's been enough money spent and on, on us under thinking that they the aviation industry, but the facts are that actually wasting food, which is in our power to change, that's the exciting part. We can all become the change makers, is, has a worse effect. If you look at the, the um, uh, households, households are 50% of, of where food waste comes from. So I can refer you to all the facts as to the back end of why I've said that wasting food is worse than the aviation industry. It, it's, it's all backed up. And, and these are the facts that we need to get out. We need people to understand because we're horrified about plastic and that's, we should be. And we're horrified about fossil fuels and coal and we should be. The thing that we haven't absorbed is that actually food waste is worse than all of them. And that's the one that's in our power to fix. Fantastic. Thank you. So you can please, the, those facts and figures will be, we're just in the process of transitioning and creating a knowledge hub on the Oz Harvest website. Um, so just watch that space. Great. And, and on the 29th of September, this campaign that I'm talking about is launching and all of those facts and figures, it's based on the facts and figures that, that the research team have done. So I guess that was one of my questions next, Ronnie, is, is 
obviously the effects of, and impacts of the pandemic, I think will be a long tail, um, you know, a, a lot of impact to come yet. And, and that, as you said, we're not even really maybe seeing the full impacts of, of what this last couple of years have had on our communities. Um, you've just talked about what Oz Harvest is, is working on in terms of that climate impact and behaviour change. What else is, is on your to-do list when it comes to this, this I guess, life's work, really? Um, yeah. is, is there something that you would love to see happen that you feel like we haven't quite got to yet? Mm, well, I told you, I'm <laughs> out of business. That's number one. But, you know, we put a stake in the ground right now. Um, what most of you won't know is that in 2015, I went to Parliament House in Canberra and actually got our country to commit to halving food waste in line. In, in 2015, the UN had not declared the UN SDG goals. Mm -hmm. So that was in 2015. And, and in 2015, we got our government to commit to halving food waste by 2025. Um, so our harvest covers five of the UN SDG goals, zero hunger, education, food waste, all of these things. Um, that have, that subsequently came out. So then we thought it was possible by 2025. Um, by 2019, it was very clear that nothing was happening. We now have nine years to achieve the halving of food waste by 2030. So I'm completely committed to working and doing whatever we can to achieve that goal. But fundamentally, this whole notion of climate change and, and what kind of a country and what kind of a planet we will have by 2050 if we don't all wake up is horrifying. I've got grandchildren. I want, I want them still to look at trees and be able to drink our water and play in the ocean. And so I'm completely committed to doing whatever it takes to, to wake us up, really. And I know that I'm talking to the converted. So please know that this group, if ever, and I mean, the work that Joe does has been so profound in getting individuals on board in a way that is so available and, and magnificent. So I do want to acknowledge that. So thank you, Joe. Thank you, Ronnie. That's don't, don't make me cry again. I feel like every time I speak with you, I cry. But that's a, of, a, of a very powerful place. You're um you're certainly pretty empowering person yourself. Um, I don't know if I'm going to put you on the spot here, but one of my favourite things is to hear you tell the teaspoon story. I Can would so that? love to. Could I you would, do that for us? Because I feel I like that would be a really beautiful way to finish the call today. Um, I'd be thrilled to. No, thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. So I want to share with you, it's the afterword of my book. And for those of you that haven't read the book, hey, might as well put a plug. There's the book. Um, is this beautiful story that I came across. And the reason I think it's so powerful is because it has fundamentally changed the lives of so many people. And they've told me so. And I do love that. So this is the story that is based on a quote from... And, and a story of an, an author by the name of Amos Oz, an Israeli author who passed away <clears throat> a couple of years ago. And I found this excerpt to read at, um, in honor, at, at a ceremony in honor of his death. And it just so profoundly resonated that I have now adopted it for myself, but with permission. And it goes like this. In the event of a huge conflagration, like an enormous fire. We as human beings each have three principal options as to how we behave. Number one, we can look at that fire and run away as fast as we can and leave those that cannot run to burn. Number two, we can write an angry letter to the newspaper demanding that those who started the fire be punished or we could start a demonstration. Or number three, we can run and find a bucket and if we cannot find a bucket, we can find a jug. And if we cannot find a jug, we can find a teaspoon. 
And I know that a teaspoon is tiny and this fire is huge, but we all have access to a teaspoon. And if we each and every one of us use our teaspoon, we will put out that fire. And so I want to invite you all to become part of the order of the teaspoon, where every day we keep our teaspoons close, that we wear them on the lapel of our shirts or on a necklace around our necks or as a ring on our finger to remind us that we all have a teaspoon and we all can use our teaspoon every single day. I invite you all to become part of the order of the teaspoon. And I will share with you that because I've been asked, and normally if I'm in person, I hand out teaspoons. I invite you to come and get a teaspoon and get a hug because I'm a big hugger. And I'm one thing I'm struggling with in COVID is not being able to hug people. But I have just put on my own website the designer of this beautiful teaspoon that I wear around my neck so that I can remember every day that I've got a teaspoon and I need to use it. Um, he made some beautiful teaspoon pendants and teaspoon bookmarks, and they are on my website. So please check it out. It's just RoniKhan.com. Wow. Thank you so much, Ronnie. I, I can't tell you how grateful we are on a rainy day, in a storm, in a pandemic, in lockdown, there couldn't be a better place to be. So thank you so much for your time. I know you're a very, very busy woman, but I feel like we're all so grateful to have you. And, and um, yeah, I just am very grateful for your ongoing uh, stewardship of this issue and for just being a bit of a beacon in all our lives as a change maker yourself, because it's not an easy journey every day, but um, thank you. Well, thank you. There's nowhere else I would have wanted to be right here and right now. So thank you all for being with us, for your presence, because every single one of you, your presence informed my talking and your listening informed my speaking. So thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Look after each other and go get a teaspoon. Yeah, stay safe. Keep your teaspoons. I will just share one last thing. You saw that conversation with Christine through all of Christine's challenges. I didn't know this, but she showed me afterwards that her teaspoon, because I had sent her a teaspoon with the book, that she kept that teaspoon close to her and has kept it close to her every single day. So there you go. It's magic. The magic teaspoons. Magic teaspoons. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.